Today on the Everything 80s Podcast, we're looking at the Garbage Pail Kids movie, which should have been an all-time classic 1980s horror movie, but turned into one of the worst movies ever made. Hey there, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s Podcast. I'm Jamie. Thanks for coming on out. And oh, what could have been. The Garbage Pail Kids movie, based on the trading cards of the same name, came out in 1987 and is regarded as one of the worst movies of all time. Instead of a clever approach at a unique idea, we instead got an absolute train wreck. A lot of this may be due to the fact that they had to get something out quickly to take advantage of the popularity, but I don't think this approach has ever worked before in movies. So this will be a look at why the Garbage Pail Kids movie should have been great, but turn into something much, much worse. But before we start, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcasts. I should be there. Okay, here we go. So let's look at where this whole movie came from and the Garbage Pail Kids themselves and a, sort of a little inside look at the whole idea behind movie productions and intellectual properties and getting things out while they're hot. So this all starts with the Cabbage Patch Kids, and I've done episodes on uh, the, the entire history of the Cabbage Patch Kids and even the Cabbage Patch Kids riots that happened. So in case you don't know, this is one of the most successful toys of not just the 1980s, but all time. They started out as a simple soft toy created by a lady named Martha Nelson Thomas. This idea was then borrowed, I'm using air quotes right now, by Xavier Roberts, who took them mainstream and allowed them to become, again, one of the hottest toys in history. The next part of this story has to do with Topps trading cards. And among sports cards, Topps had some other styles of trading cards, including one called Wacky Packages. So I'm not sure when you grew up, but, you know, if you grew up in the 80s, you were familiar with not only, you know, sports trading cards, but then some of these other um, bizarre novelty cards. If you go back even earlier, uh, Topps put out all sorts of different cards that weren't just sports-based. So Wacky Packages specifically produce spoofs of popular consumer items such as cereals or household cleaners. So when the Cabbage Patch Kids became a massive hit in 1983, Topps thought it was a good idea to put out a line of Cabbage Patch Kids trading cards. This idea, though, was cut off by the Cabbage Patch Kids uh, head people. So Topps figured they would take a page from Wacky Packages and put out a parody line of the Cabbage Patch Kids. They played around with different names to call this parody um, set of trading cards, and one of those names was the Garbage Pail Kids. It started out as a single card, but the people at Tops thought that this might make a good spinoff series, and that's how the Garbage Pail Kids trading cards were born. And they were very successful. Again, I'm not sure where and when you grew up, but for me specifically, These things were massive when I was a kid. There's something about gross-out humor that will always appeal to kids, and the Garbage Pail Kids were a massive hit immediately. So I was around, how old was I, 10-ish when these came out. So I'm right in the wheelhouse for this sort of like gross-out humor, sort of that Mad Balls era of disgusting 80s nostalgia. The more popular the Garbage Pail Kids became, the more the opposition started to happen. Parents hated them. Teachers hated them. They would end up being banned in many schools. I remember my school specifically not having an official ban, but it was still sort of frowned upon. And we had to keep them pretty low key. And I remember having to hide them in my pencil case in my desk. Um, They were like contraband. And again, uh, that's just going to make kids want them even more. There was so much negative press around the Garbage Pail Kids, and all it did was help drive up the sales. The Cabbage Patch Kids people really didn't like this either, and the inevitable lawsuits started rolling in. Even though Klopp, or sorry, Tops claimed this was a parody, the judge involved sought more piracy because they were making money based on another creation. Garbage Pail Kids could not exist if it wasn't for the Cabbage Patch Kids. Tops would deal with this problem by changing the aesthetic look of the Garbage Pail Kids along with the fonts and logos used on the cards. 
if you're uh, have access, well, if you're listening on your phone right now and you can open another browser, do a Google image search and look up Garbage Pail Kids cards. And if you look at the first series and the early, early releases or those that, you know, wacky packages card, you'll see the very distinctive Cabbage Patch Kid look. And then you'll see how they progressively changed over the years. Legally, they had to. So let's look at the success of the Garbage Pail Kids and how this inevitably led to the movie. Like any successful property, you want to strike when the iron is hot and milk the thing for all it's worth. In the 1980s, there were so many iconic toys and shows that standing out became quite difficult. Any new toy or release or, you know, cards like these had to go up against juggernauts such as G.I. Joe, My Little Pony, Transformers, He-Man, the Smurfs, the list just goes on and on. If you were going to make a dent in that market, you had to make quick work at getting as much content out there as possible. And that's what brings us to the Garbage Pail Kids movie. This is now getting into the later part of the 1980s and the interest in the Garbage Pail Kids is starting to wane a bit. They were looking into creating a cartoon show, I'll get to that in a bit, also a very interesting side note, and of course, the smart move seemed to be to put out a movie. Movies based on intellectual properties in the 80s could be pretty hit or miss, again, because they're trying to get these things out so quick. You had successful ones like the Transformers movie, the My Little Pony movie, but then you had some flops like the He-Man movie or the GoBot spinoff, The Rock Lords. So in combination with Atlantic Entertainment Group, Tops would produce a Garbage Pail Kids movie. So let's look at them putting this thing together. Since this was seen as the final push for the Garbage Pail Kids, Tops and Atlantic Entertainment Group did not want to put a lot of money into this movie. That's usually the first sign of problems. It's kind of like they were aware it was going to be a flop and they just didn't want to invest too much on a budget of only one million dollars they were going to produce an entire live action feature film today honestly a million dollars doesn't cover catering on many movies so a guy named rod amatow was brought in to direct the garbage pail kids movie and he'd been part of a lot of cool productions over the years including the dukes of hazard gilligan's island my mother the car that was a real show mr ed the george burns and gracie allen show so he had a pretty good um <clears throat> resume as far as entertainment it would end up being the last thing he directed before retiring in 1989 he took the job as simply a paycheck he knew nothing about the garbage pail kids this was just a way to i don't know pay off some bills or whatever he had one meeting with the people from tops which apparently was very awkward he didn't seem to care about any vision they may have had and he was just going to make whatever he wanted it's kind of interesting that they didn't go with the cartoon series first before launching the movie it's as it seems like these things were supposed to go hand in hand together but that didn't really work out so let's look at the plot of this movie. I'm not going to make any assumptions or judgment, but you might, I'm probably betting you haven't seen this movie as a lot of people have never ever seen it or even heard of it. But here's the basic plot. Bear with me. The movie starts with a garbage can that is speeding towards Earth. We never see it land, but it somehow ends up in an antique shop. While this is going on, we meet our main character, Dodger, who's being chased by people in their 20s, which no one seems to be looking into. Dodger works at the antique shop, and one day the bullies track him down there ready to do their bullying stuff because deep down they're broken inside, they hate themselves, and they project this onto other people as all deadbeat bullies do. A tussle begins in the shop, and in the middle of this, the garbage can is knocked over, spilling a green ooze out of it, which you can make your Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles connections here. Before he gets the crap kicked out of him, some mysterious little people emerge, thwarting the attack. After this, we meet the Garbage Pail Kids. They are disgusting, misshapen little humanoids with various flatulent issues um, that are running jokes to the movie. Like the Ninja Turtles, the kids are forbidden to go out in public as it's feared they will be attacked by the normies, a.k.a. normal people. It turns out there are other Garbage Pail Kids out there, and the bunch we meet are still searching for them. We then get into this whole thing, how the Garbage Pail Kids are adept at sewing clothes and are producing them to be sold. The kids eventually venture outside in disguise, and they end up in a bar drinking, very similar to like the gremlins do on Christmas Eve. 
This brings us to a fashion show. The main clothes designer has finally met the kids, is repulsed by them, but realizes she can use their talents. She locks them in a basement, uh, in the basement of the antique, antique shop, but they get captured by the bullies who take them to, and I'm not making this up, the state home for the ugly. This is a prison where those deemed too unattractive for society are locked up to be executed. This is a children's movie, remember? Dodger helps them escape and brings them to the fashion show, which they end up trashing. The bullies end up being locked up and they try to recapture the kids in their garbage can, but the kids bust out on ATVs into the night to wreck more havoc. Okay. So let's look at who is in this movie because there's some interesting people in this thing. So uh, one of the main characters, Captain Manzini, was played by Anthony Newley. He was a musician and singer who was once nominated for an Academy Award and had been in dozens of other movies. The Kid Dodger was played by Mackenzie Aston. Aston was son of John Aston, who played Gomez on The Addams Family. He apparently never told his dad he was auditioning for this movie. His dad read the script, thought it was so bad, and then tried to get his son out of it. But his son had already signed a contract. And this kid, I think, is like 14. So somehow was able to audition and sign a contract without any parental supervision or lawyers, or anything. That's how movies seem to be made in the 1980s. Tangerine, uh, the one clothes designer girl, whatever, was played by Katie Barbary. She was on Kids Incorporated, if you remember that show. She was also in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, also in Silver Spoons. Uh, Juice was played by Ron McLaughlin. He was also in movies like Silk Stockings. Just a a few select uh, performers there. So who played the Garbage Pail Kids? This is much more interesting. They were played by little people actors uh, with some that have done some incredible stuff. So one, uh, Phil Fondacaro played Greaser Greg. He appeared in Willow, The Black Cauldron, <clears throat> Troll, and was an Ewok in Return of the Jedi. You would remember him because he's the only Ewok we see that gets killed in the battle. Debbie Lee Carrington played Violet Vomit. She's also done some amazing stuff. She was an Ewok also in Return of the Jedi, uh, also appeared in Polar Express. Howard the Duck uh, was a Martian rebel in Total Recall. You might remember her best, sounding like Troy McClure, from Seinfeld, where she played Tammy in the episode The Stand-In, where they find out Mickey had been using shoe lifts to look taller. She was the blonde. She also played Little Bigfoot in Harry and the Hendersons movie. She was in Men in Black and performed stunts in Titanic as the child actors. So that's just a few of the physical performers, but the kids in the garbage pail kids movie were brought to life by various voice actors. Most notable is Winnie the Pooh himself, Jim Cummings, who provided voices for greaser Greg and Nat nerd. Cummings was also the voice of Tigger and the Tasmanian devil and later said it was the only thing he ever regretted making. So I want to look at now sort of the main premise for this episode of why this movie should have been good. Um, And it did have some great intent to it. And this could be one of the 80s classics that we talk about, like Goonies or Gremlins, but obviously it's not. So, of course, no studio or production company wants to put out a flop and lose money. Uh, And the Garbage Pail Kids movie, of course, was no different. Top saw some possibilities In this unique movie idea, and the actual creators of the original Garbage Pail Kids trading cards had some very creative ideas to make this thing work. These are very um, ingenuitive, creative, um, you know, forward thinking people that are who created these cards and are seeing sort of this little mini universe. So, you know, they fleshed out these characters and where they came from. And that's the same idea they had with the movie. But it comes back to that director who his intent was just to get something made and take the payday from it. So in an interview with Mental Floss, Garbage Pail Kids creator Mark Newgarden stated um, that he hated Amitau, the director, and didn't Um, And the director didn't want Tops getting in the way of anything he came up with. And it didn't help that he knew nothing about what made the Garbage Pail Kids tick. Amato cared so little about this film that the people at Tops thought it wouldn't even get made, which probably would have been the better approach based on what got released. When the Tops people saw the first images of the makeup tests uh, and the characters designed and the outfits they would be wearing, they were horrified. It's not that the Garbage Pail Kids necessarily lend themselves to anything 
cinematic or, you know, any cinematic mastery, but what Amitau was coming up with didn't even attempt to create quality. The story of the movie was written by Bill Tennant, who was in charge of the distribution of the movie. So not exactly who you want to take creative control of your story. The story was written on a single sheet of paper and then turned into a script less than 60 days before shooting started. Always, I did an episode on Mac and Me, and usually the biggest red flag for a movie are the script issues either going into the movie um, when it's coming down to the wire before shooting starting, or in the case of Mac and Me, writing is happening as the movie's going on. That's guaranteed train wreck country there. The Garbage Pail Kids creators were hoping to be involved in the script writing as, again, like I said, they're not just very creative people, but they had the specific ideas because they've been creating these cards for years. And they, again, they had the backstories and they had the vision and they weren't able to, you know, be creative. And when you sort of stifle creativity, you know what you end up with. They were completely out of the loop, but the idea was that they were needed to keep making new series of the trading cards. Uh, To the people who write the checks, once they had a deal, it was a take the money and run situation. So the movie just sort of fell into the hands of, you know, cranking out content and not worrying about uh, putting, you know, it's not that anything has to be incredible or awesome, but like you do have to draw some interest into it and you've got to look at what you're making and who these characters are as stupid as the concept of the garbage pail kids are, you you still have to, you know, go into that world and commit to it. So here's some more production on the movie and some more reasons why it, it should have been different. When asked about thoughts on the story of the film, Amatel replied, why would I think about it? <laughs> this is clearly one of the biggest problems facing the movie. And he would go on to say, it's not a picture you think about, it's a picture you shoot. The other big problem facing the movie was the original intent. The idea was that this was going to lend itself better to an animated movie instead of a live action one. That was the original plan. They just didn't have the budget for it. Animation was so much more expensive in those days. Today, it's way cheaper and uh, live action has become much more expensive compared to in the 80s. not to go on too much of a side tangent of this, one of the reasons among many of why Saturday morning cartoons disappeared is how expensive animation became and they moved more into live action, which was cheaper, like, you know, picture just Saved by the Bell or whatnot. Today, animation is always the easier route to go. Wasn't that case in the 80s. The idea that could have made this movie great was a sort of who framed Roger Rabbit approach where it would have been a combination of animation and live action. And to me... This would have been the approach that could have made this movie something pretty good. Again, sort of following the standard uh, tropes and and styles of these 1980 movie, 1980s movies that we know so well. It could have pretty easy, easily seemed its way into um, that mold of a lot of these other now modern classics. Uh, but again, it was just the cost was too much of any form of animation, whether it was a full animated movie or... It was a blend between animation and live action. They just didn't have the money for it. So they were forced to go with the cheapest option, which was obviously to put costumes and heads onto little people and hope this would translate well onto the big screen. Unfortunately, with a million dollar budget for everything, that that's everything. <laughs> um, the costumes were so cheaply made that the actors could barely breathe in them. They would have to rush the scenes before anyone was passing out due to lack of oxygen. Um, they actually would use stopwatches with paramedics nearby, knowing they could only go a certain length of time before there would be trouble for the actor inside the suit. The budget was also so low that they could only afford to make one head per character. If the head got damaged, then you're too bad. You were stuck with it. So you add these crappy costumes that the actors can't breathe in and you mix it um, with also being shot in a warehouse in the San Fernando Valley with no air conditioning and the whole production becomes obviously a nightmare. Besides the discomfort for the actors, the metal roof of the warehouse was interfering with the radio signals controlling the facial expressions on the head. They couldn't get a majority of the shots they intended because they just couldn't create the scenes um, with the controls of the characters that they intended and needed to do. 
Okay, so here's the release of the movie. Here's another issue. It was always thought that this would be better intended for a TV movie. And I think you can see that if you ever see this movie, you can definitely see that reflected in the in the film. I don't think there's ever been a good made for TV movie, but at the very least, this should have been like a straight to video type production. Either way, the movie was rushed and finished in just two months. Another massive red flag. There was no screening. There was no feedback to make improvements or changes to the film. They didn't smartly didn't let critics pre-screen it or pre-review it. Pretty much everyone who worked on the movie wouldn't see it until it was actually in the theaters when it was released on August 21st. 1987 again the probably that's probably the smartest thing they did in this movie not having a pre-screener because it cut down on all the um, inevitable negative reviews that would have come out before the movie even debuted but it did not matter critics trashed the movie with many calling it one of the worst movies ever made kevin thomas in review for the la times in 1987 stated that quote they should have kept a lid on the garbage pail kids movie and that was sort of the headline that everyone ran with today it has a zero percent rating on rotten tomatoes again not there's never always there's never like a perfect time to release a movie you try and do market research back then wasn't what it is today they still did it this was one of the big issues with the mac and me movie check that episode out if you want again the ultimate train wreck in a production the problem with the mac and me movie was the producers in the studio actually thought they had a good movie on their hands. They they really genuinely thought they had the next E.T. And they put it out in one of the biggest blockbuster summers in history, thinking they could compete against all these juggernaut movies, Think like against movies like um, Die Hard and Big and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I think it was the summer of 88. So with the Garbage Pail Kids movie, it opened around the same time as some pretty big movies like Dirty Dancing and The Big Easy. There was, uh, for kids, there was still The Care Bears Avengers in Wonderland, which was a decent hit. The Garbage Pail Kids movie made a paltry $600,000 in its first weekend. It would only end up making around $1.5 million by the end of its run. Even though it was made for just $1 million, it was still obviously a financial flop due to all the money that went into advertising and marketing. So as I said, how could this movie actually have been? How should it have went? The movie did have the chance to be something unique. If you're not familiar with the cards, it's hard to maybe explain this. If you do know the Garbage Pail Kids and you did grow up with this, you know that this had some originality to it. It it was something that stood out. Again, the concept of the Garbage Pail Kids is gross, but whatever, it's still somewhat intriguing and would have lent itself very well to some sort of horror movie. It's not like they were the only ones doing gross out horror based humor in the 1980s. Again, it's hard to look at, say, uh, the best comparison, like the Child's Play Chucky movies, and think how they really missed an opportunity to go that route. Not only did the people at Tops think it would have suited a horror movie better, but the actors and the other people involved with the film thought they were missing the mark with what was produced. If they were going to stick to their sort of wacky premise um, that the movie became, they should have gone the live action comedy route like Roger Rabbit and just bite the bullet on the cost and at least have people talking about how good the effects are and how cool the live action animation crossover is. Um, make it just more like window dressing. People can put up with that even with a crappy movie. I guess you only get out of a movie what you put into it, but animated characters over live action would have you know, allowed again for more creativity because of the fact they just weren't willing to spend money on the super cheap costumes that just made the scenes look terrible compared to here. Another awful movie, the Howard, the duck movie. In that case, they at least spent a fortune. I think it was close to like a half million dollars. It might've been more on the actual Howard, the duck costume because they're like, this thing has to carry the whole movie. It's got to not that it has to look realistic, but it has to function properly and have some life to it. The garbage pail kids movie is just these, terrible costumes with these heads plopped on there there's no bringing them to life like you would with other um costumes or or muppets for example you know you get more life out of kermit the frog which is just this piece of felt um, by 
um, the performer doing it and, and how that can come alive. But, you know, the, the actual physical creation has to be there and they just weren't with these costumes. Again, look them up if you haven't seen it. It looks like a kid's like school project. That's how bad some of these costumes look. But overall, the movie should have, it should have taken a more evil approach uh, because that's what these characters are at their core. They had the opportunity to potentially make a horror classic and it would have appealed to a much wider range of audiences. I think the problem is no one knew exactly what this movie was intended for. It was thought that no one over the age of five was going to see it, but then it still had a PG-13 rating. So they had some intent for an older audience, so they should have gone that way. By telling a horror story, they would have attracted an audience of teenagers and adults. They would have already been familiar with the trading cards um, because they grew up with them. So it wouldn't have been another generic horror movie, but one with a pop culture sort of twist to it. It was all there. Uh, The horror movie, again, especially in the 80s, is a pretty good moneymaker, and people tend to go to these movies sight unseen just because it's a horror movie. If you tie that in with a known franchise like the Garbage Pail Kids, you could have had for that great sort of Chucky, child's play type creation. But I'll start winding it down here. Um, The Garbage Pail Kids movie... Still, it does have a bit of a cult following to this day, and they were even planning a sequel while the first one was being made. It's a little overconfident. That obviously didn't happen. The cartoon show I alluded to earlier was supposed to be released alongside the movie. It ended up being thwarted in a very interesting sort of history story about uh, due to parental and religious groups, and it never saw the light of day, even though they had made 13 episodes. They eventually came out on DVD, but the whole issue was... Uh, anything to do with the Garbage Pail Kids had run its course by that time. It's like now going almost into the 90s. They still have a legacy as the trading cards continue to be released to this day, and there's still new series that are released and um, recreations of the original ones. It's still relatively popular, but the movie itself remains a stain on the history of cinema when it could have been something uh, creative and unique. So that's it for... I don't know. I think it's kind of an interesting look back in film history. And it's always fun to look at, you know, the worst movies of all time. And I've covered a few of them already in the show. Like I said, Mac and me, Howard the Duck, go back and check those episodes out. So you've come this far through the episode. And I just want to talk about one other thing. And it's related to a way to support this show while still getting, you know, something for it for yourself. So Podcasting is an awesome medium. You're listening to this. You obviously love podcasts. You might you might listen to 10 or 20 of them. I don't know. The average person listens to around seven, apparently, at the last thing I checked. The problem is with this show, for example, this is completely independently produced, made by me, the whole deal. These days with podcasts, because the whole platform has grown, it's now tougher to compete against celebrities, corporations, gigantic podcast networks. So I use a thing called patreon.com and that's a way to support the show for as little as like two bucks a month, but still get something out of it. You get bonus content when you support the show and there's different tiers and each level comes with different rewards. So in like the second tier I have, which is called the Boba Fett level, you get access to the everything 80s movie review show where I would go more in depth on, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly, like the Garbage Pail Kids um, on there. So that's just for uh, Patreons there. So if you want to learn more, you can check it out at patreon.com slash 80. So patreon.com slash 80s. Wherever you're listening to this, you know, where you can see the show notes and the details, there'll be a link if you want to go and just have a look closer at something like that if you're interested in it. But I'll finish off here. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this show. Again, there's so many podcasts out there now, which is a good thing. But the fact you're listening to this one means a lot. I will be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it.